Okay, so hello everybody. Um, sorry for the a little bit of a wait. I was having some technical difficulties, um, but I'm so happy to uh, be here today talking with Ryan Miley. Um, I've known Ryan for quite a while. He was a doctor in our community for many, many years. Um, and yeah, now I see him kicking around Saskatoon. So um, I'm excited for the chat today. So I'll let Ryan introduce himself a little bit. Great. Well, thanks, Jordan. Yeah, it's uh, really cool to get a chance to chat with you. I remember you from, from Isla Cross uh, and when you used to help out our, our Making the Links students, the medical students that would go spend the summer there and, and you were always a, a pretty great a uh, pretty great contact to get people to know the know the community, understand what was really going on. And uh, yeah, so thanks for taking a bit of time to interview my, me. I'm Ryan. I am a family doc and also leader of the NDP uh, here in Saskatchewan and the MLA for Saskatoon Miwasa. And that's where I'm talking to you from today. I'm at my MLA office uh, on 3rd Avenue here in Saskatoon. Cool. Okay, so there's a few different directions I want to go with this. Um, there are some pretty controversial topics going on, um, happening kind of as we speak. Um, and I guess um, without getting too like political to any which way, <laughs> um, I would be really interested in your medical mind in all of this. Um, but also keeping in mind that, you know, um, from your level of leadership, um, what direction you'd like to see things going, and I guess just a, a general opinion on, on some of these things. So um, where I'd like to start is um, maybe on the topic of energy, if that's cool, um, which I think is really cool. <laughs> but I'm, I'm currently working with a group from across Canada um and we're called seven gen so we're, we're hosting a, a national indigenous youth summit that'll be happening in saskatoon hopefully we'll see how things go we're trying to make it happen but covid has a mind of its own so um but potentially in march we'll see cool. um and that'll bring 200 youth from across canada um, to talk about energy and the role of Indigenous youth in that area. So um, my question to you is, what do you think, like, in terms of where we're at in the national landscape, in terms of energy, um, what are some things that we could be doing a little bit better provincially? Like, there's, there's a ton going on in BC for hydro and a lot of solar projects you see. Um, you know, in, in Quebec, they have ton of, a ton of wind, things like that. Um, and then all of the different little programs that support um, clean energy. So what are your, your thoughts on where we're at? Um, my mind goes to, uh, to your neck of the woods, to Green Lake, where they put up a solar project that was uh, powering the local town hall. And that's the kind of thing that should be happening all over Saskatchewan. We have the best environment in the country for the production of energy from solar power. We have great opportunities of wind, There's some really exciting new technologies in geothermal, uh, and just so much we could be doing, and yet we're in last place. Now, uh, when it comes to the move to renewable energy, uh, under the staff party, we just haven't gone anywhere. In fact, they canceled the net metering program uh, just a few months ago that made it possible for people to afford uh, that move to solar energy in their own homes and businesses etc i'd like to see us go the other way and i love the idea of involving more indigenous communities we've seen leadership like green lake and metis community or or Cowess's first nation that's doing some really cool work with solar and wind and energy storage there's so many opportunities in saskatchewan one of the things that we've talked about as new democrats is often when people say oh i'd love to put up uh, solar panels i'd love to uh, redo my house so I'm using less energy or maybe be part of a wind co-op or some other way of lowering my bills and being part of the move to green energy. But who's got 20, 25 grand to get in there, even though you might save that over the next few years, that barrier to entry is just too much. So what we'd like to do, people are already paying those power bills, paying those, uh, those natural gas bills. 
let's, instead of saying, if you build this yourself, you'll save it over time, we come in with our crown corporations and say, we'll lend you the money to do it now. We'll lend you the money to do it now, and you just keep paying the bills you're already paying. No more money for you. And then once it's paid off, those bills are down to next to nothing. You've made that transition to green energy, and in the process, we put thousands of people to work in every corner of the province. You know, it's not one giant plant in one town, it's every town and every community having loads of jobs. So you know, when we talk about opportunities for employment for young people uh, to not have to leave uh, their home community, but to actually be able to see things they can do right there. I think we'll see all kinds of small businesses pop up around this as people develop their own models, try different technology. There's just so much we can do, uh, but it takes some leadership, takes some creativity. So really exciting about the, the project that you're involved in, uh, Indigenous Youth and Energy. I, I think there's a lot we could do there. Yeah, for sure. And I'm very excited. We have a pretty solid team. People, it was initially supposed to be in Ottawa, um, and it was going to be partnered. And, and we're still partnering, partnering in a small way with, um, or I guess in a big way, with Indigenous Clean Energy. Um, okay. and kind of like our, 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 our main um, host company, I guess, uh, organization is Student Energy. And they're a national or an international organization. So, um, yeah, there's some really, really incredible technologies. And I think um, one of the things, another thing I'm also working on in Isla Cross is um, we're looking to introduce an energy efficiency project. So it's it goes with the, the whole slogan of um, a kilowatt saved is cheaper than a kilowatt produced, right? So that new infrastructure just costs so much money um, and it, it is a, a part of the process, right? But I think the, the, the main part that people often forget is that energy education and preparing for people. Like <laughs> I remember, and I don't know if people remember this, like comment, but do you remember the much music campaign that was like flick off? And it looks when you spell it out, it looks a little a little harsh, but you remember it, right? Like little campaigns like that to keep people like in line, turn off your darn lights, kind of thing, you know? Yeah, and you know those individual changes are, are good things to encourage, um, but really we need to make sure at a, at a provincial level, national level, we're making that easier for people to do. You're absolutely right. The kilowatt of energy you don't use is the cheapest one, and the the least impactful one. Uh, let's get some programs in place so that people can save those dollars, but uh, you know, be able to actually afford to make the changes in their homes. It's not just about flicking the lights on or off. It's about what kind of electricity system you have in your home, uh, what kind of windows, what kind of furnace, all of those things that people would like to make those changes, be happy to have a more efficient house, but how do you, how do you afford that? The renew Saskatchewan allow people to get in the door. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's that's one thing that that I've come to find is you know utilities hold a lot of power and like no pun intended, but um, they literally get to determine whether or not you get to be involved in the energy game, right? So um, I guess that's that's a way to kind of get around it in a, in a sense, but. Um, yeah, it would be so cool to see some some major renewable projects going on. That'd be really neat. Um, so just to completely shift gears, I want to talk about Indigenous youth. Um, there's a lot going on right now in our province, in our country, around the world, like um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, Indigenous Lives Matter, all of these things have kind of been ongoing for a while. Um, one thing that I find that isn't talked about, not nearly enough, um, that will really, I think, shape the future of our province, especially considering we have like one of the highest uh, percentages of Indigenous people and young people at that in Canada. Um, but the youth incarceration rates, Indigenous youth incarceration rates. So um, for people that don't know this, for, for girls, Indigenous girls make up 98% of incarcerated youth. Only 2% are non-Indigenous that make up our prison systems for, for young people. Um, and for boys, it's, it's I think it's 92 or 94%. 
Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And what are some strategies that, that you kind of look at to, to make change in, in that area? I mean, the, the first thought is how completely unfair that is and unjust that we would have a situation where one group is so overrepresented in our correction system. When you talk about youth corrections, it's absolutely right. Above 90% uh, on, in both uh, young women and young men. Then you get into adult corrections. We're up in the 80% range uh, still First Nations and Métis in adult corrections. Also a little earlier than that, it's not corrections, but it's, a, it's another system where people are separated from their families and that's foster care. You know, of the 5,000 plus kids in care, 80% are Indigenous. Uh, and so you've got this whole system where uh, we are failing kids, are failing young people, we're failing young adults, and it's resulting in them getting into situations where their lives are even harder, you know, they're getting even further behind. We need to spend a lot more time on those kids first, make sure we're investing in, in young people, investing in their opportunities and helping prevent crime. And when people get involved, using that not as a way to say, okay, now you're a bad person, you're stuck in, in juvenile, you're stuck in prison, but oh, your life is clearly not going the way it should, something's broken, let's step up and support you to get better. Um, one of the people I, I really respect in the city works with straight up, talks about people in gangs and, and viewing it as people aren't bad, they're sick. They're often dealing with mental health and, and childhood trauma, they're dealing with addictions. Uh, punishment isn't the, isn't the point, it's how do we actually work with people to rehabil rehabilitate them. We are seeing a big investment from the government, 120 million bucks for a new remand center, which is basically just to put more people away in a time during their incarceration where they don't even get any programs or, or counseling or help to get better. That's the wrong place to invest. We should be investing upstream, helping people uh, be in a much better better circumstances. And, and I think about the larger picture of the, the big gaps that exist between Indigenous people when it comes to employment, to justice, of course, to health outcomes, and to education. And we really need a provincial government. And instead of being a barrier, so the points and says, oh, it's up to the it's up to the individual reserve or, or First Nations or Métis community, or it's up to the federal government, we're, we're not gonna do anything. We need a provincial government that's gonna lead, that's gonna actually be a facilitator to make sure we're doing the right things to help reduce those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, so the theme, and like this is unrelated, but related, um, the theme of our energy summit this year is uh, the value of kinship. And that's what that makes me think of is like, we've lost this idea that our communities are all akin, right? Like that we are all related, that, you know, doesn't matter what socioeconomic status we have or what color we are, like we're a part of this greater community. And, you know, the it's like the, <laughs> like my volleyball coach used to say, you know, like you're, if one team member is down, like it brings down the rest of the team and you need to help lift that person up for a stronger team. And, and like that goes with, with businesses, individuals, um, you know, all the systems that are in place in society. And, and that are, I don't know, it's just weird that we don't work in that, that same way anymore, you know, like. Yeah, and, and the point is, yeah, if people think, oh, that's somebody else, I'm not part of that group, they're struggling, but that's not me, uh, that's misunderstanding the fact that when one section of our province is struggling, that hurts everyone. Uh, it hurts everyone on an economic basis. You know, we know our province loses $4 billion a year to uh, poverty, uh, that the economy is $4 billion poorer because of the added costs associated with poverty. We know that, you know, if some people are struggling and that leads them to crime, it means others are less safe. Uh, if some people are struggling and that leads them to be ill, that means when you need to go to the emergency room or the hospital well, maybe those services aren't as available. We need to recognize that anybody doing badly in the province uh, drags us all down. And uh, 
your volleyball coach uh, said it exactly right. The next point, you might have to remind me. Um, well, you wanted to talk a little bit about suicide, and uh, I, I was glad okay. you wanted to raise oh that. I'm so sorry. I can't okay. even, I'm sorry to the people that are listening to my brain fart there. Um, yeah, exactly that, right? Like, um, it's, it's pretty crazy how the cards that young people, young indigenous people are dealt pretty well before they're even born. You know, like just the stats on, on suicide, the stats on youth incarceration, um, mental health issues, all of these things. Um, you know, like it's almost like we're born to just be sick, you know, because our, our communities are not helping us do better. You know, our communities are not changing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I wanted to chat a little bit about um, suicide and um particularly what's going on right now in regina tristan derosher is on day 22 i believe of his fast um so what are your your thoughts on that and how involved have you been in that in that front um my first thought as you talk about that is uh is actually to think about you you're somebody that i admire uh who i I think is a great example of how our communities, northern communities, can and do produce people who aren't sick, who are able to do great things. And, and I'm sure you've had your struggles just like we all have, but you're, you're somebody who's thriving and doing great. And I, and I see more of that, and that excites me because I, I, I want people to understand that it's not how it has to be. Yes, the truth is that Indigenous young women from Northern Saskatchewan, 29 times more likely to die by suicide than non-Indigenous women in Saskatchewan. Uh, boys and, and young men, it's six times, which is still a huge difference. 10 to 49, the, the, that age group in Northern Saskatchewan, suicide is the leading cause of death. So clearly we have a big problem in Saskatchewan. We're leading the country in suicides per capita and so much more needs to be done. Uh, I had a chance to walk with Tristan in Prince Albert in, in Saskatoon and in Regina and to visit him a, a few times at the legislature. I think that's uh, him and, and all the group around him, uh, of the Walking with Our Angels, has, have done an incredible job of elevating attention to this. Uh, and that came out of a work done by Doyle Vermette, who is the MLA from Cumberland, from the Lalange, who put forth a bill for a suicide prevention strategy and the 44 members, all the members who voted from the SAS party voted it down, sending a terrible message to all those families that are grieving, all those young people that are wondering if their lives are worth living, that sent the exact wrong message. And, and what I love about what Tristan's doing, what we're trying to do is it sends the opposite message that this is worth huge efforts and huge sacrifices to fix. It is important enough to do something. Uh, what do we do? You know, I think we do need a strategy and we need to work with the communities themselves and, you know, highlight the people who are, uh, talk with the people that are struggling, but also highlight the people who are doing really well and find out what made the difference for them. Uh, and some of the things that would go into a strategy like that are some of what we were talking about before, how we prevent crime, how we prevent hopelessness is also how we prevent suicide and depression. They come from the same trauma, the same uh, lack of opportunity. So those upstream factors. We also need to make sure there's primary care available so that when people need help, when they need counseling, it's available and affordable. So we don't say, sure, you can have counseling, but it's a hundred bucks an hour. No, we say, you need help. We've got this help ready for you and right away. Because right now, so often when somebody wants to get off drugs or, or see a counselor, we have to tell them you're waiting three, six months longer. And then the last thing that I'll, I'll mention is the need for independent, um, dedicated mental health emergency rooms, especially in our major centers, PA, uh, Saskatoon, Regina, Mishra, et cetera. Uh, so that when you are in that moment of a crisis, you don't go in there lined up with the heart attacks and the broken legs and getting seen last uh, by people who are, are distracted by those physical ailments. You get to see people who have that great training 
and we're there to see you because that's what they're there for. Uh, these are some of the things that I think we could we could do. It's obviously going to require working with communities to come up with the best plan together. First step is admitting it's a big problem and, and committing to doing more. So just from a medical perspective, how does, um, like, when do elders and, like, community people get involved in terms of, um, like, intervention? Yeah. Uh, I uh, was thinking about some, some of the, the stories that we hear about interactions between police and people in the community that don't go that well. And we're thinking about someone who said we should start a cook and patrol of, uh, of elders who can go out and, and, and talk people down and, and, uh, and understand where they're coming from. It's, a, it's one of those ideas out there that emerges from people's actual understanding of community. So I think one in the big planning, that's where we absolutely need elders and community members involved uh, because they understand what's going on. I also think there's there's real roles and, and models that we've seen in other parts of the world to employ those um, and involve those informal community leaders to to help be part of being a support for folks in in, in those times of crisis. Yeah, I had a I had a chat with uh, Harold Johnson. This was actually a while back. I was actually still working at Northlands, and he was like, I have an idea. It's awesome, but um, it was putting some merit behind some of the people in our communities who, you know, like the Cookums who have been beating for like 50 years or the trappers who've been doing that for however long, you know, and all of that like knowledge that is passed down and, and it's like lived experience, right? It's something you just can't read in a book, but we don't hold merit behind those roles and communities. And that same thing goes for elders. Like we say, okay, we're going to include an elder to come and do a prayer for the day. Let's pay them a hundred bucks. We're good. We, we check the box of having an elder there. Like we're not inclusive enough and thoughtful enough in how we actually engage with community, I think. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of like all of these like land-based education programs and, um, just opportunities to be out in the bush. And I am like super bush, man. I've been like out there, like as soon as COVID hit, I was like, peace out Saskatoon. <laughs> so I've been back lately, but you know, it's just so healing. And like, we need to get kids out there and we need to recognize these people in our community that like are healers. They work with the land, they're healers, you know? And have you seen a shift? Like, I know we, we did some work with the University of Saskatchewan Medicine, but um, I don't know you're still there but yeah i know there's a there's a growing understanding of how connection to land connection to ceremony connection to the tradition connection also to uh to political advocacy and action on behalf of your community lots of research that shows that that is actually really protective against mental illness and, and risk for suicide uh there's so much that we can draw on it's already in our backyards in, in all kinds of different ways. And, uh, and I think it's a, a really important part of the discussion. How do we use, uh, use what has been really has evolved over centuries as ways of keeping us healthy and whole uh, in this new world where we're all on our phones and, and on screens and, uh, and traveling around. How do, you, uh, how do you bridge that gap between the elders and the youth? Um, I remember somebody joking up in one of the communities that wanted to start a youth center and an elder center in the same room and then just uh, have those people hang out and, and then you wouldn't need any any more interventions because you'd have the young people and the elders listening and learning from you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so thanks, thanks, Jordan, for uh, for reaching out to to have the conversation. Um, yeah, you I bet. It's been a long time coming, so I'm glad we finally made it happen. <laughs> and thanks for all the work you're doing with the COVID response in your community as well. I know the, the Northwest faced some really significant challenges and was amazed at how, even without much in the way of government support, community stepped up with your emergency operations center. There was so much going on, really.
yeah, it was a really, it was a really interesting thing. And I think kind of the first of its kind where every community really came together and like, it was, it was really, really interesting, really cool to be a part of. But yeah, I was glad to see we finally got some support for that. <laughs> so that was good. Um, but yes, I won't take up too much more of your time. So thank you. Um, I hope that gave people a lot to, to think about, a lot to absorb. And um, if you do have questions, you can post them up in the in the comment section here. And Ryan is my friend on Facebook, so I'll be helping him to answer those questions. Uh, tell me. But, um, okay, yeah, thanks have for the weekend, Ryan, and thank you. Thanks, you too. See you soon. Thanks, Des. <laughs>